So my name is Dr. Tori Blackwell, and I want to welcome everybody to our first STEM talk of the spring term. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, I also think it's pretty cool the way that the timing worked out that we get to have this particular speaker on Earth Day because the, the talk itself really fits in well to you know the mission and purpose of having um, those Earth Day events and kind of thinking about how we as humans impact the planet. So let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Schmidt is our speaker for today and she received her PhD from Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, she also did postdoctoral work at Princeton University. I was lucky enough to meet her as a graduate student way back at the University of Illinois uh, at Chicago. I was a super fresh graduate student and I spent a term working in her lab. I can say that it was um, some really cool things I thought. And as I look back, I realized it was actually some really basic things that <laughs> were just good things to get me in the right mind space to be able to survive in a lab space. Um, and I also like to tell people, students that may have had me in the past may remember, remember me talking about um, imprinting and how it kind of blew my mind, just the whole concept of imprinting and how that worked. And this is the lab where that took place. So I can say that this is a professor that literally blew my mind as a graduate student. <laughs> um, so at that time, her focus was on gene regulation in mice and looking at how gene expression affects, affected development. And since, that, since then, she has expanded that work to look at um, other organisms, including the whale shark, to better understand how development works. And since 2016, she has served as the Director of Science and Research at the Shark Research Institute. So with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Schmidt. Thanks, Terry. That's great. Can everybody hear me okay? The sound is good? Perfect. Okay. Well, as Tori said, I work on whale sharks. I've worked on a lot of different things. I've had a bit of an eclectic career, and I usually think that's kind of a good lesson for students that, you know, you find something interesting and you pursue it, and you have a good chance of succeeding at that. I've moved around. I've studied humans. I've studied mice. And now for quite a few years, I've been studying whale sharks. So what I'm going to try to do here is just give you a bit of a background on this animal that I've been focused on for quite a while. What is a whale shark? What do we know about them? What do we not know about them? Turns out we actually don't know quite a lot. We have many, many open questions. And then I'm gonna go through just a little bit of the various research projects that we have going on, show you what the tools are that we use and, and what kind of answers we, we've been able to get to understand whale shark biology um, and, and ecology of this animal. Okay, let's see. So this is a whale shark. They're gorgeous animals. Uh, they're kind of a dark gray on the surface. They have this pattern of spots and stripes. It's really beautiful. It's a, it's, a, it's a pattern of spots that's unique to each animal. And I'll come back to that a couple of times during the talk. We actually use this to our advantage for research. Now, if you see a whale shark, this is what it'll usually be doing. It'll be swimming up near the surface. Most of the time when those animals are feeding, we find them up near the surface, and that's kind of nice. They're easy to access, they're very easy to work with. A lot of deep water sharks are, are very difficult to work with. Now the whale shark is a shark, it is not a whale. That name is a little confusing and it causes researchers a lot of trouble. The name comes from the fact that it's as big as a whale. Whale sharks are the largest shark and they're the largest fish. Now, we say they reach 14 meters in length. Those are the biggest sharks we see today. And think about how big that is. That's a really big shark. In the past, it's been reported that sharks were 18, 20, even 22 meters. We do not see those big animals anymore, which is probably unfortunate. It probably means that the largest sharks have been fished out. What we see today is about a 14 meter shark. And they have a very long lifespan. I say 75 to 100 years, but really we don't know. It could be longer than that. These are, this is an estimate based on how long large animals tend to live, um, how long we've been able to study some individual whale sharks, but they may have well over 100 plus lifespan. So whale sharks are pelagic. That's the term we use to refer to them. So pelagic species are animals that live out on the open sea. For the most part, they stay away from coasts. They use deep ocean waters um, far from 
any place that we would be able to study them actually. So how do we even study a whale shark? Well, we take advantage of the fact that some animals, mostly juveniles, will form aggregations, groupings near shore. So the adult whale sharks, we rarely see. They stay out far from shore. But the juveniles, particularly juvenile males, they come to these aggregations that are near shore because there happens to be a lot of food in a particular place and at a particular time. So these, this graphic that I put up here, if you look at that red band, that's the habitat of whale sharks. They like nice, warm, tropical waters. And they try not to stray out of those waters for the most part. It would be odd to find a whale shark out of that habitat. Now those yellow stars, those are the places that we know periodically whale sharks will aggregate. And usually in those spots, there's a particular sort of food that the whale sharks will come together to eat. This might be a spawning event. It might be a large aggregation of plankton, a particular school of fish. And the nice thing about these for researchers is one, they're close to shore and it's much easier to get there. Two, they will have a lot of whale sharks, sometimes huge numbers of whale sharks. I'll show you one aggregation site that had more than 600 whale sharks. And three, they are recurring. In other words, animals will return for the most part every year to the same site. So I know that if I go to Mexico in August, there'll be lots of whale sharks there. I know if I go to my field site in Africa in December, there will be lots of whale sharks there. So this makes it possible to do research on a species that otherwise would be really hard to find. Now, the downside to this, and this will become clear a little bit later, is most of our research is done on juvenile males. We don't have a lot of information about the other classes, about the adults, or even about juvenile females. So sort of keep, keep that in mind a little bit. When, I'm, when I get to talking about whale shark reproduction, you'll see how little we know because we really don't have the ability to study the females. Now, I mentioned that these are filter feeders. They eat lots of different things as long as it's small. They eat plankton, they eat small crustaceans, they eat little fish. They eat the spawn, the eggs of fish and coral. And I'll come back to this again later as well. So if you see a whale shark in the water, he's probably going to look like one of these photos. He'll be right on the surface. And sometimes there'll be so much on the surface that as in that right photo, the, the upper jaw is actually out of the water. And what this fish is doing is he is swimming and he is scooping water. And he's funneling a huge amount of water into his mouth, pushing the, the water itself out his gills and waiting for the plankton to collect on little filter pads that line the bottom of his mouth. So he's sieving out all of the plankton. And if you see them in the water, every once in a while, you'll see them kind of close their mouths and swallow. And they're swallowing that food back from these filter pads. And the way this very large animal eats is by filtering huge amounts of water, thousands of gallons of water, and pulling out this microscopic food source. Now, I can show you if this video works. Another, so this is one type of feeding you'll see right on the surface. There's another type, um, or maybe not. Let's see if it works. There we go. Oh. Well, okay. This was supposed to be video number two. This is a different animal. This is a manta ray feeding next to a whale shark. Manta rays are also plankton feeders. So one of the things that's pretty cool is it's often possible to study manta rays and whale sharks at the same aggregation site. So this is in Mexico and we'll see whale sharks. They're doing this vertical feeding at, at this particular spot with the manta rays just swimming right around them. And they're both eating the same food. Now, what I really wanted to show you is, there we go. This is another type of feeding that you might see in whale sharks. He's a little bit below the surface and he's doing these huge gulping motions, but the process is the same. He's taking in large amounts of water, filtering it out through the gulls. You'll see his gulls flaring there a little bit on the sides and collecting the plankton that's in the water. And notice how turbid the water is. That's all food suspended in there. And in this particular site in Mexico, it's, it's very rich in food. And that's why so many sharks come there because it's a, it's a very rich food source for them. So, so it's not all good things for whale sharks. There are a lot of threats to these animals and the threats come from a variety of causes. Fishing, the process of finning, which I'll explain in a minute if you're not familiar with it, something called bycatch and, and, and strikes by boats as you might imagine for an animal that's on the surface of the water. 
So how do we know that these animals are threatened? Well, we followed some of these aggregations now for as long as 20 years. And what we see at these long-term study sites is that whale shark numbers are going down and that the sharks we see there are getting smaller. So we think that that means that the big reproductive age animals, which are really the important ones, are being fished out. And because whale sharks take a long time to mature and because they grow very slowly, it's, it's decades for the population to begin to recover if we let the numbers fall too low. So all of our research is, is oriented at understanding the biology of the species, but also in finding out information that can help us conserve these species. And after a lot of lobbying by researchers, a, a group called the IUCN, which keeps track of the conservation status of many, many animals, they've now listed the whale shark as endangered. So he, he was considered threatened before and has now been upgraded to endangered because of this decline in numbers. So this makes conservation a little bit simpler because it puts more restrictions on what can be done with whale sharks and whale shark products. So we, we all work pretty hard to get that passed. So what happens to whale sharks? Well, they're caught for food. In some places they are, they're eaten for food. They're also caught for their fins. And if you don't know about shark finning, it's a barbaric practice where you catch a live shark, you cut off his fins and you throw the body back. Often the shark is still alive. And down there in the left, you'll see a pile of whale shark fins and they're huge. These are used to make shark fin soup, which is extremely popular in parts of Asia. It's, it's a pile of cartilage in a bowl of soup. There's nothing, there's nothing magical about it. It's not an aphrodisiac like people want to think but it is very popular in certain parts of Asia and many, many, many sharks are killed for their fins. Whale sharks are sometimes taken as bycatch, which means things you catch when you're fishing for something else. And because they often co-occur with tuna, the tuna fisheries accidentally kill a lot of whale sharks. And a lot of them are killed by boats because they're right on the surface of the water and the ships just don't see them. So there are a lot of threats. And, and as I said, a lot of our work is, is focused on what do we know? What can we learn that can help in conservation of the species? One of the things, and I'll, I'll mention this and I'll come back to this at the very end. One of the things that can help if it's done properly is ecotourism. In other words, taking swimmers, divers out to see whale sharks in the wild. Because these aggregations are predictable, in many countries, ecotourism operations have, have sprung up at the sites. So if you go to Australia, if you go to the Philippines, you can get on a small boat and go out and you can snorkel with a whale shark. There are guidelines for this. That's what the chart I'm showing you there is. Um, to impact the shark as little as possible. And again, if it's done properly, the impact on the whale sharks are, can be minimal. And it's a huge economic boon for the local populations. Many of these towns, these little coastal towns are fairly poor and they fish sharks for, for food and for money. Now, if we can show them that the whale shark can be a living resource, something that is renewable, one whale shark can bring in millions of dollars in tourist, in, in tourist money over a period of time, as opposed to killing that shark for its fins and, and using it once. So this has been one of our goals is to promote responsible ecotourism, involve local people. Very often the tour operators were fishermen who used to kill sharks. Now they show the sharks to people as, as a living resource. And this has been very successful. It has a ways to go, but it's been very successful in many places. It is a great educational opportunity. I see a lot of kids come out at these sites to learn about whale sharks. And it's an opportunity for citizen science for the public to participate in research. And I'll, I'll come back to that again a bit later. So what are the things we use to study whale sharks? Well, I'm gonna go through just a few questions and a few research tools and tell you a little bit about what we do. How do you, how do you study this animal? What questions do we ask? So one of the things we want to know about whale sharks is how fast they grow. They have a lifespan of about a hundred years. So you can't really just sit and watch them grow. We have to estimate this by some other method. One of the ways we've been doing lately is, is using really a, a, a very simple device. It's a it's a, little, it's a little metal bar with a camera mount in the center and two dive lasers, two underwater dive lasers attached. You can go out in the field where whale sharks are aggregating, line this up 
cal it's all calibrated so you can you know the the size of, of the distance between the lasers you line this up on the whale shark you take a photo and then you can use that photo to extrapolate the entire length of the shark this has been really helpful and as we've been doing this people are starting to put together growth charts of of this animal that swims freely in the ocean and yet the the recurrence of these individuals a shark that comes back to the same site every year, we can measure him every year. It's kind of amazing that you're able to do this on a free living ocean animal. But this, this reproducibility, this return to aggravation sites has been very, very useful. So we're starting to get a handle on, on how fast these sharks grow. And, and that's really useful. That helps us estimate age. It helps us estimate sexual maturity when these animals are able to breed. Lots of, lots of important things. And this little device costs about $100. It's actually really easy to put together. Okay, we want to know what they eat. So we study plankton. Wherever we find whale sharks feeding, we study plankton. And then sometimes we study plankton where whale sharks aren't feeding to try to understand what the differences are and why they target certain areas. And again, the, the equipment is, is quite simple and inexpensive. It's a, it's a long net made out of a fine mesh with a collecting bottle on the end. We'll put a little boat in the water next to where whale sharks are feeding and just pull the net behind the boat and collect a sample of the plankton. And, and that enables us to actually get some of what they're eating. So the, the photo on the right there, that's a bottle that was towed behind a boat at, at a site in Mexico. And this is a very short tow, a couple of minutes. So that bottle is chock full of fish eggs and it shows you how much food is in the water when these sharks are there. And then we wanna know what, what, what that is. What is the plankton in different places? Remember they eat lots of different things in different places. So we can do a variety of things. We can do simple microscope analysis. If they're eating krill or little shrimps or fish, it's pretty easy to identify those species just by looking under the microscope. If they're eating fish eggs, which is what's in this bottle, all fish eggs kind of look the same. So then we have to go to genetic tools. So there's a nice little trick called DNA barcoding, which is sequencing a small bit of the mitochondrial genome and using that to identify the species, it works remarkably well. It's very easy and inexpensive to do. So this bottle collected at this site in Mexico, I just wanted to show you what one of these sites looks like. So just to orient you there, if you look at the photo on the bottom left, the two large white objects, those are the boats. And all of those other smaller objects, those are all whale sharks. And that's zoomed in a little bit over on the right. So you can see how dense those animals are. This is crazy. We don't see this anywhere else. This, there are so many sharks there. This particular count was done on one of the best days I've ever seen there. And I believe they came up with a total of something like 600 animals. And it's in a very small area. I mean, you, you, you can't jump off a boat without ending up next to a whale shark. Now, not every day is this good, but I would say it's rare to see less than 200 whale sharks. It's a, it's a very, very dense aggregation, and it's driven by an absolutely massive amount of food that the sharks are coming for. But again, it's all fish eggs, so what is that food? So if we analyze those fish eggs, well, if you do it microscopically, you see a pile of fish eggs, there's a little shrimp in there, but mostly that bottle is chock full of fish eggs. So we have to do it genetically. So this is one of the places genetics comes into the study. And when we genetically identify these eggs through DNA barcoding, we found that they belong to a small mackerel tuna called, locally it's called little tunny in Mexico. Eutenis oleteratus is the scientific name. This is really important. So many whale sharks depend so heavily on the eggs of this one species. There's only one species, all of these eggs that 600 whale sharks are eating. So we want to know the status of those fish. Is the, the population of fish stable? Are they perhaps threatening themselves? There would probably be a huge impact on the sharks if those fish were no longer there to spawn. So luckily, this little tunny is a very abundant fish. Its populations are very stable. People eat it, whale sharks eat the eggs. And that's all, that's really good for whale sharks in Mexico. Now, one other thing I'll mention, and this is kind of interesting. We, we did a study looking at a, another aggregation site of whale sharks in the Arabian Gulf, so other side of the world. But also the, the fish there were, the sharks there were eating fish eggs. So we did the same genetic barcoding on the fish eggs and we found that they're eating essentially the sister species to little tunny, another eutenus species called eutenus affinis. 
So it's kind of interesting. Whale sharks half the world away are eating almost the same thing. Okay, what else do we do? Well, we want to know where whale sharks migrate. We want to track their movements. We want to understand when they move and how they move and, and where they move. There has been some evidence for a long time that whale sharks may do very long migrations, may move between oceans, across oceans. And we'd like to, to understand how and why they do this. So there, there's a couple of ways to track movements of sharks, and I'll, I'll tell you about two of those. One way is by using satellite tags. So this is a tag that's applied to the shark. That photo on the upper left, the tag is on an anchor that's inserted into the skin near the dorsal fin. There's another photo I'll show you later where the tag is attached with a clamp that actually goes over the dorsal fin. The whale sharks are right on the surface. It's really easy to apply satellite tags. You just jump in with your snorkel and bam, you put the tag on. The downside to satellite tags is they're very expensive. We pay, depending on the type of tag, we pay between two and $4,000 for each tag. And then there are various other charges for satellite time and things like that. So you can't put out too many and, and they tend to fail. They fall off, the batteries die, all sorts of things happen. But when it works well, this is an extremely powerful tool. Every time that shark goes to the surface, that tag will float free of the water. The tip of that tag will float free of the water and it'll ping the satellite. And it will tell you exactly where that shark is, what he's been doing, what direction he's heading, the timing of his movements. It's, it's data that we, we can't get any other way. So what has this shown us? It's a little difficult to extrapolate what we know from satellite tags to the many, many whale sharks out there because we just don't have enough data yet. The expense of the tags and some of the limitations mean that we only, we get a snapshot of a certain period of time in a certain animal's life. But if we look at their data, we see that most of the sharks stay fairly regional, local to regional. So they're down there on the bottom left. This is a shark which was tagged in Dubai in March. He swam around in the Gulf for a little bit and his tag came off in April and he was only, I'm not sure what that distance is, maybe hundred miles away. So he really didn't go very far. And you can also see his tag really didn't work very long. So we got a small amount of information for a large amount of money. Now there are many other local tracks that last longer than this one did. I just showed you one example. We have a lot of information that many sharks stay regionally. What we really want though are the long migrations and those are very tough to come by. You have to tag the right shark at the right time. And that's happened in a few cases. So on the bottom right, I'm showing you probably the best satellite track anyone has ever gotten. And unfortunately it wasn't mine, it was colleagues, but I am happy to come. This was a shark that was tagged off the coast of Mexico, that aggregation site I just showed you. It was a large female, which was unusual for the site. She was a mature breeding age female. She left the area almost immediately after being tagged. She made a little stop in Cuba, and then she headed out into the Atlantic. And her tag finally came off at a, at a, a oceanographic feature called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge which is basically the center of the Atlantic Ocean between South America and Africa. This is a crazy long track. It's, it's thousands and thousands of kilometers. And she swam pretty fast, September to February. She covered a lot of ground in a fairly short period of time. We would love to have had her tag last longer and to see what she did after that. Did she stay at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge? Was she going to Africa? It's very possible she was going to the coast of Africa. Is she going to be breeding out there somewhere, given that she's a large reproductive female? We, we don't know that. What we do know is that the next year she didn't return to Mexico and she was a regular. The second year she did. And she's been seen now in Mexico every year since. So she took a two year long trip and we only see a few months of it here. So she spent more, another more than a year and a half doing something out there that we have no, no information about. So we, we're starting to piece together these long migratory tracks with satellite tagging and with another technique that I'll show you shortly. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of my data. This is some work that we did in Djibouti in East Africa, which is where I work in November and December. 
There's an aggregation of whale sharks there. Really interesting aggregation. So Djibouti, I don't know if my mouse will work, but if it does, Djibouti is this little C-shaped country right here, right here on the zoom. And you see this large gulf with like a little bay in the back of it. This is where the whale sharks are in here and back in this bay. And it's interesting because Djibouti has the smallest whale sharks that we find anywhere. These are really young animals. We get whale sharks as small as two meters. And a two meter shark is probably not much more than a year or a year and a half old. So we get, this gives us a look into the early life of these species. And it's, it's hard to find that information any other way. So we're really interested to look at what these really young sharks are doing in Djibouti. So we've been working there for a number of years, but only recently started satellite tagging. Now last, well, not last year, last year we didn't do anything. The year before we put out four satellite tags. And two of those tags gave us some data. This is very preliminary. We'll be doing more tagging this year. One of those tags was on a shark that was a five meter juvenile nicknamed Max. This is Max here. And you can see hopefully on the dorsal fin, you see the little tag that's clamped onto there. It's a little spring clamp like you might buy at Home Depot with a $4,000 satellite tag attached. Max has that tag and nearly as soon as Max was tagged, he left Djibouti waters entirely. And we really didn't expect that. One of the nice things about sat tagging is they tell you almost immediately what your shark is doing. We expected him to stay there for the entire season and he didn't. He left, he moved out of Djibouti waters. He moved into the Gulf of Aden this is a little bit of unrefined. He really didn't go across land. What he did is he came up here into the Red Sea. And this is this is the Red Sea, the southern part of the Red Sea. Unfortunately, Max's tag fell off in the southern part of the Red Sea. So that's as far as we're able to track his movements with this particular satellite tag. But it was still really exciting to see that. We have photographic evidence that whale sharks move between Djibouti and the Red Sea, the Saudi waters in the Red Sea but no one has ever actually seen one make that trip. So this was pretty exciting, even though it was short and very preliminary, it was exciting to see Max go up into the Red Sea. Nobody else had shown that before. And now we had another shark, and this was Byron. He's even a smaller shark, four meter juvenile. Byron was tagged in this far, far back part of, of this gulf here. And Byron didn't leave. In fact, Byron didn't even leave this tiny area where we tagged him. He spent weeks just swimming around and around in the same little area. And then eventually Byron's tag stopped transmitting. And we thought, well, okay, that's that's not terribly exciting. He's, he did what we expected. He swam around and he fed in this area for a long time. But then we got some really unexpected information. It turns out that after Byron's tag failed, it didn't come off the shark, at least not right away. And a, a liveaboard dive boat Crazy things happen in research sometimes. A liveaboard dive boat that was taking divers up into the Red Sea sent a little skiff onto the beach right here in the entrance to the Red Sea to have a picnic. And while they were on the picnic, they looked around and they found our satellite tag laying on the beach. So, and these, it's a small place. They, everybody knows everyone. They knew us, they called us. They said, do you want your tag? We said, yeah, we want the tag. And what we wanted even more was to know where the tag was found because Byron's tag died here, but Byron kept moving. And when his tag actually popped off his body, he was, oh, I'm losing my mouse. He was here in the entrance to the Red Sea. So again, it's very preliminary data, but we've got two sharks now with tracks showing them leaving Djibouti and moving up into the Red Sea. So it's gonna be really exciting this year to be able to put out more tags, track more animals, hopefully over longer periods of time, and try to see if that's a regular migratory pathway for these, for these animals. That would be really neat to see. Okay, another way we can track whale shark movements, very different, different methodology, different advantages and disadvantages. This is using the spot patterns of the whale sharks themselves as a sort of a living tag. Now this project has been going on for about 20 years. I put out a big paper a couple of years ago on what's been learned in the last 20 years of, of using spot pattern identifications. The, over that time, we, we know that that spot pattern of whale sharks did not change, at least over 20 years time. As the shark grows, the relative positions of those body spots doesn't change. So it's like a fingerprint that we can use, presumably over the lifetime of an animal, to try to find the shark. 
So how does that work? Well, there's a huge database that uses the spot patterns of the whale sharks to identify individuals. And, and it's a really cool database. It uses an algorithm that was actually developed for the Hubble telescope to identify stars in the sky. I mean, it's light spots on a dark background. It's all, it's stars, it's whale sharks. And it works really, really well. There are a lot of advantages to this. It's a living tag. This, there are no, those spots don't fall off. They don't stop transmitting. They're always there. It's essentially free. You just need a camera. It is a project that, that the public can participate in. So anyone can take photos, ID photos of a whale shark. Many of them are taken by researchers, but lots of them are also taken by people swimming with ecotourism operations, by divers who happen to see a whale shark. We get all kinds of submissions. And it's also nice that it's not invasive. You're not having to put anything on the shark or in the shark. Neither one of these techniques is useful, is fully useful alone, the, the spot pattern identification or the satellite tag. But together, they make a really nice pair of tools to be able to understand whale sharks. The downside to spot pattern IDs is someone has to be there to take the photo. So if no one takes the photo, there's no evidence the shark was over there. So we find most of our photos are coming from these, these very heavily visited aggregation sites where there's ecotourism, and, and, and that's fine. And these two technologies merge pretty nicely. So what do you do if you happen to see a whale shark? Let's say you go to Mexico and you swim with whale sharks. You take a picture of the left flank of the animal. You'll see the spot pattern there. You take a nice photo that's straight on, and then you send it to us that we, and we, we manipulate the photo, we crop it down, we mark all the spots, and we feed it into the database to use the algorithm to compare. And the algorithm will come back with one of two things. It'll either say, nobody's ever seen this shark before, it's a new animal, which is cool. We've added another shark to the database. Or it'll say, yeah, we know this shark, and he's been seen here and here and here and here. And some of these sharks have been followed, as I said, for, for 20 years or more. Some of them have been photographed dozens or, or even hundreds of times. So we have a lot of data that comes from using this photo identification. I'll just give you one example. This is a shark at that Mexico aggregation that I showed you. Uh, shark number 183, also named Bagel. I don't know why he's named Bagel. And this shark has been tracked for 10 years and he's been photographed 26 times over 10 years. And I wanna show you a couple of things. One, that even using your eye, I think you can probably track some of the spot pattern similarities. For example, this little curve here and this little curve here, this little U shape here and this little U shape here. So while this is done by an algorithm, it's always double checked by a human eye. The other thing to take away from this is how different, so these are all different photos of Bagel down here taken at different places and times, is how different these photos can look depending on the conditions, the lighting conditions, you know, sun shining on the water generates all of these shadow patterns, turbidity of the water, or this looks like a jerky photographer hand, I think that can affect things. So, oops, oh, didn't want to do that. So it is tricky. It's tricky to match these photo IDs. It requires a very sophisticated computer algorithm and, and essentially a human eye to double check the computer. Okay, so now I want to segue to what really is, is mostly my specialty working with the whale sharks, which is genetics. What can we do with genetics to help us understand whale sharks? You're, you're all STEM students, so I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the basics of the genetics. I'm sure you know this already. All individuals of the spe same species do not have identical DNA. Each individual has subtle differences. It's what makes all of us look slightly different, different hair colors, different eye colors. If we look at these differences, this variation within a single individual, whether it's a human or a whale shark, we can make a genetic profile. It's, it's the same as what human forensics will do. Now, if we combine individual profiles of animals found in a certain place or time together, what we call a population, we can make a population profile. And if we compare these profiles, both individual profiles within a population, and comparing also the population profiles, we can learn a lot about the sharks. We can learn about genetic diversity. How much variation is there overall? This tells us how healthy a species is genetically. Is there a lot of variation that will help it respond to threats to change? 
we can learn about population structure, which is one of the, the things that I'm most interested in. Where and how do these sharks migrate? If animals are intermixing, if you have two populations of sharks and those sharks intermix, individuals move back and forth, their genetics will be relatively similar because they'll be passing genes back and forth. If those two populations of sharks are completely separate and they never mix over time, their genetics will become quite different. So this is what we're asking. Are the, are the genetic variations within different populations of sharks similar or not similar? And we can also ask about reproductive strategies. We know almost nothing about whale shark reproduction. Where and how does mating occur? Questions like this. And I'll, I'll touch on that just a bit at the end. So how do you do genetics on a shark? Well, first you need a piece of the shark. So nicely, whale sharks are right on the surface. They can swim at a good clip if they want to, but most of the time they're feeding and they're moving relatively slow. We do all this work on snorkel. We use a, a long handled spear that's driven basically with a, a large, strong rubber band. Uh, it's got a little sharpened tip at the end. You poke this shark right about here. The sh shark skin is incredibly thick. He doesn't usually even feel this or react. He keeps swimming. And you end up with a little bit of shark tissue in this vial. Sharks heal so quickly, these little holes close up in a matter of days. And this, is, this little bit of tissue is really enough to do a, a large amount of genetic analysis. Now, the particular DNA sequence, the variants that we study are called microsatellites. And chances are you've heard about these already in genetics. These are DNA sequences that are repetitive, either two, a repeat of two bases or three bases or four bases, GT, 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 et cetera. And the reason these are useful for genetic studies is that they change a lot. It has to do with how they're seen by the DNA polymerase. They add or lose repeats over time. So really, when we, when we study microsatellites, we're not looking at the basic sequence itself. We're counting the number of repeats. So microsatellite data isn't, isn't a sequence, ATC, ATC, ATC. It's a number. It's 46 or 128 or something like that. How many repeats there are? And as I already mentioned, if animals are closely related, repeat numbers will be similar. If they're less closely related, repeat numbers will be less similar whether or not those, those animals are, are, their change is occurring together with admixture of animals or whether it's occurring separately. So how related these shark groups are can tell us a lot about their migration. It can tell us, do they move together? Or do they move separately? Do they migrate or are they locally restricted? So this has been an ongoing study. It's still an ongoing study. And this particular map was taken last year, I believe. I think there's about 610 animals in this particular study. At the moment, the project is closer to 800 animals. But these stars are aggregation sites where we've been able to sample whale sharks. And if you remember the map I showed you at the very beginning with all those little aggregation stars, you'll see it's pretty similar. We don't have samples from every site, but we've been able to represent most of the main aggregation sites of these whale sharks. And for this particular purpose, I have grouped them into ocean specific populations. So these sites are animals that are in the Pacific. These sites are animals that are in the Indian Ocean. This is a Pacific shark as well. And animals that are in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to compare these three ocean populations. So I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all of this genetic analysis. I'll just say that there are lots of different ways to analyze genetic data. Microsatellite data is a stream of numbers. So if you have 612 sharks, you have an enormous spreadsheet with all these different genetic marker lengths. And you can manipulate this data, you can study it numerically, you can study it graphically. This is a numerical analysis. It, it's probably not worth going through because it's much easier to see graphically. And this is just one type of graphic program. This is a program called Structure that we use to analyze genetic similarities and differences between animals. Now, what Structure does is it takes all of your individual data with no preconceived bias as to where those animals were sampled. Doesn't put any emphasis on whether they were sampled in the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. It simply says, if I just look at the genetic numbers, how many groups of similar animals can I find? Is it just one group? In other words, all whale sharks are the same. 
Is it two groups? Is it maybe 10 groups? Every one of those little populations is completely different. What we find when we analyze our data for the oceans, now I should say each one of these lines is an M. So we can go back then into this graph and we can say, okay, where was this animal found? Where was this animal found? Where was this animal found? And when we do that, we find that there are two distinct whale shark populations. And here they're illustrated in green and in red. These are pseudo colors that the program applies to make it easier for you to visualize this. Remember, we've got three oceans. If the program had been able to identify three unique populations, it would have added a third color. Third color is blue. We don't have any blue sharks. So when we go in and we look at these animals, Atlantic Ocean sharks are green. Indian and Pacific Ocean sharks are red. Now this is not a hard and fast division, but in general, the Indian and Pacific Ocean sharks, there's no ability to separate those genetically. In other words, genetically, those two are the same. And to a large degree, the Atlantic Ocean sharks are also genetically unique. So these two different, these three oceans make up two different populations of sharks. And again, there is bleed over. This is not a perfect mix. So we know just looking at this that there is movement from the Atlantic Ocean into the Indo-Pacific. If, if there were no movement at all, you would have a hard line here, all green and all red. In, in real nature, that almost never happens. Okay, so, so what can we sort of draw from just this very quick look at this analysis? Well, we, we see very little genetic difference across the Indo-Pacific. We see a lot of difference between the Atlantic and the Indian or the Pacific Oceans. So this tells us that the Indo-Pacific animals migrate freely, they breed freely across oceans. Basically, that's one population but that the Atlantic Ocean animals are more restricted, not completely restricted, but more restricted and interact quite a bit less with the Indo-Pacific animals. And I'm gonna try, if it's not too far, I'm gonna try to go back to this map. Think about what it takes for a shark to move from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And remember where they like to be. They like to be right here, nice warm water. Well, it's very easy for the shark to move here and to come into the Pacific it's much more difficult ecologically for a shark to move from the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean. And I would say sharks never ever do this. Um, this is extremely cold water, very inhospitable to whale sharks. And even waters here in the south coast of Africa, this is much colder than they like. So part of the reason that these Atlantic animals are restricted is probably geographic. It is outside of their comfort zone to make this movement. They do it because we do see some overlap of the, the two colors in that schematic, but they do it less frequently, as opposed to an animal that can stay in its nice warm comfort zone and swim through. So what does this mean for conservation? We need to come back to conservation of whale sharks. Well, we can think of it a couple ways. We can think of one, we might wanna protect Atlantic Ocean whale sharks as a separate, uh, a separate population or subpopulation. They probably face unique threats, they don't move in great numbers into the Indian Ocean, and those might be managed separately. The Indo-Pacific animals are a little bit more complicated. If you think about a whale shark swimming from the Western Indian Ocean to the Eastern Pacific, he's crossing through waters of dozens of countries. So we can't protect whale sharks with country-specific regulation. It's, it's, they're, they're much too mobile for that. We need essentially international protection to conserve these animals. We need countries to get on board through groups like the IUCN and various other types of conservation organizations and try to enact global protections for whale sharks because this, this is not an animal that obeys country laws at all. Okay, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit now at the end about whale shark reproduction. We know almost nothing about it. Um, we know that they probably don't reach sexual maturity until they're 20, perhaps 25 years old. The growth rate information we've been able to get tells us that an eight meter whale shark, which is when we first see the males become mature, is about 20 years old. So that's one piece of information. But we don't know where they breed. We don't know how they mate. Some sharks mate in groups. Um, whale sharks may meet singly. Remember, we're thinking about adults here now, and we don't even really know where the adult habitat is. 
the adults tend to be out on the open ocean. They don't frequent these aggregations very often. So we don't know how mating occurs. We don't know the length of whale shark gestation. It is likely to be upwards of two years based on similar animals, but it's never we've never been able to measure it. We don't know where females have their pups. No one has ever observed a whale shark female getting birth. And we don't know where pups spend their first one or two years. I told you Djibouti has the smallest and youngest whale sharks. But even the smallest whale sharks we see there are at least a year or a year and a half old. So there is some sort of habitat that newborn whale sharks use that we don't know. We don't know where they go. We don't see them. It's very, very rare to see a newborn whale shark. And that's a, and that's a complete question. When, when we do start to see them join aggregations, it, it's at spots like Djibouti and one or two other places where we get these very small sharks. And I say that newborn whale sharks are very rare. They're so rare that something like 50 individuals have been documented in all of the scientific literature as long as people have been documenting these things. And I'll show you in a minute that female whale sharks have a huge number of pups, upwards uh, several hundred pups, at least 300 pups potentially from a single female. So there should be baby whale sharks everywhere, but they're not. They are using some kind of habitat. A lot of people think they go to depth. We really don't know. When you see one at the surface, it's very unusual. And these are just pictures of a couple of newborn whale sharks. The one at top is the smallest whale shark that was ever found, smallest free living, free swimming whale shark. He was found off the coast of one of the islands in the Philippines. About a month later, the shark in panel B was found very close by. He's a little bit bigger, a little bit more mature. We're pretty sure that these were probably siblings from a single litter. It's, it's just unlikely with how rare these animals are that two would be found a month apart in, in very close proximity. Unfortunately, we don't have samples to be able to track this, but we do believe that they were probably siblings. And then in panel D is just uh, another little bit older whale shark. This shark is about a meter and a half and probably six months old or something like that. But again, these, these young animals are very, very rare. Pregnant females are very, very rare. We've only had one pregnant female to study ever. This feeder female was 11 meters, so she was big, but not the biggest female out there. She was caught in fishery in Taiwan in 1995. The fishery was legal at the time. In Taiwan no longer fishes whale sharks today, but they were doing so at the time. And the fishermen pulled her in and they started to cut up the shark and they noticed something was different. And to their credit, they stopped dissecting the shark. They went down to the local marine university. Luckily, the town is a very good marine university. And they brought some researchers over and they said, you guys want to have a look at this? And they did have a look at it. In fact, they performed very careful, very nice dissection documentation of this female and of the pups that she was carrying. And she taught us a lot of things for one animal. First of all, she taught us that whale sharks are ovoviviparous. I don't know if that's a term you've run across. Animals can give birth by eggs, oviparous, they can give live birth, viviparous, or they can do a weird hybrid, and that's what whale sharks do. The, the whale shark embryos start out in an egg, and they complete most of their development in an egg, an egg case. Shark egg cases are kind of odd looking. But before they, they leave the female, while still in the uterus of the female, they hatch out of the egg case. And they're born as free living live young. So ovoviviparous, a hybrid between live birth and egg line. So what was actually in this female? <clears throat> what was in this female was more than 300 individual embryos. And uh, I, I, I kind of love the researcher who laid these guys out in this little grid on the dock there and took this photo. It, it's a huge amount of embryos in a single female. I mean, it doesn't, even, no other shark even comes close to how many, how many embryos it can carry. And what was really strange about it, and something we're still trying to understand, is that within this single female, there were different groups of embryos that differed by age. Some were younger, some were more in the mid part of their development, and some were much older and ready to be born. And that's extremely unusual for any species. We've never seen anything like this documented in sharks, and I'm not even aware of it happening in, in other species of animals. The single female carrying embryos of, of differing, differing gestational ages, it's very odd. So lots of questions then from these whale sharks. Remember, this was published in 1995. 
Were these 300 embryos all fathered by a single male or were there multiple males? One way to explain those different ages would be if a female whale shark swam around and she mated with one male and he fathered some pups and then another one fathered some pups and then another one fathered some pups. That would, that would make sense. And then, but we could tell that genetically if we could look at the, the genetics of those embryos. Now, if they don't have multiple fathers, well, then how do we explain those differing, the different ranges of developmental stages? Now, in 1995, genetics in some species was pretty well advanced in humans and mice, not in sharks. There were no tools to look at this in 1995. It would be another 15 years until we were able to actually do the studies to, to answer these questions. And um, we started talking about this after a conference with one of the other researchers just kind of throwing out wild ideas. And we said, you know, whatever happened to those 300 whale shark embryos? And he said, well, I don't know. Do you think they still have them? Nobody had thought to ask that in 15 years. Um, so we started contacting people and asking them if they had those embryos. I mean, that's a lot of fish to store for 15 years. You guys know how freezer space is precious. Well, it turned out most of them had been thrown away, but finally we ran across one of the initial researchers and he said, yeah, I've got some in the freezer. You can have them if you want. So we immediately fly out to Taiwan and we go to, to his lab to see what he's got there. And we found whale shark embryos. They weren't in great shape. And they were in this, this frozen mass of freezer burned animals laying in the bottom of this dirty freezer. They weren't even wrapped up. It was very undignified. And there weren't that many. There were 29 embryos. So about 10% of the original litter. But that's what we had. And so we decided to look at those and just see what conclusions we could draw, even with a subset of individual animals. So we thought these guys out. Turns out that they gave very nice DNA, even though they've been freeze thawed a bunch of times. And we were able to do a sort of a paternity test to ask, are these individuals full siblings? In other words, same mom, same dad, or half siblings, same mom, different dad. And this is pretty easily done with the same microsatellite markers that we've used for other genetic studies. One of the nice things is that when we got these embryos thought out, we found that there were animals from all those different size ranges. So some smaller animals here, like this one on the left, little bit larger animals like this one in the middle. And then the one, the 60 centimeter animals, this is about the size at which they're born. So this guy was probably termed potentially ready, ready to be born. So what did the genetic analysis tell us? I'm not gonna show you the actual data. It's another spreadsheet full of numbers. I'm just gonna give you the, the, the punchlines. So we found that all of those 29 whale shark embryos had the same dad. Now, that's only 29, that's not 300. So there are types of analysis called probability analysis that you can do to extrapolate from small numbers and say, well, how likely is it that all of the, the entire litter was fathered by a single male? We only have 10%. And what this analysis told us is that if there were a father, a second male, who had fathered more than 5% of the 300, we should have seen him represented in our data set. Now, we can't say for certain that there was no second male who was a minor contribution, but the vast majority of that single litter of those 300 embryos was fathered by a single male. So this backs out one of our hypotheses right away. The different developmental stages of these embryos don't correspond to mating events, different mating events with different males. Well, so what's the explanation? A lot of people want to have happy, lovey sharks who mommy shark meets daddy shark and they swim together and they mate repeatedly over time. And each mating event fathers some of her pups, but there's no evidence for any kind of pair bonding in sharks. Sharks mate and they're gone. It's very unlikely that whale sharks pairs stay together long enough to mate repeatedly over a period of so what are we left with? We're left with the likely hypothesis that female whale sharks can store sperm. This has been documented in a couple of other shark species and in, and in some non-shark species as well. And it's really a great adaptation for how adult whale sharks probably live out on the open ocean, probably not running into other individuals very long. 
If a female whale shark might only meet a male and have the opportunity to breed on a rare occasion, it would certainly be to her benefit to be able to store sperm. Then she can fertilize her own eggs over long periods of time. And, it, and she doesn't really need to find another male right away. And it's very difficult to prove this. We obviously would love to see another female whale shark litter, but it's it's been 25 years and we've not seen one yet. So we work with what we have. It is possible to address this question anatomically, if we could dissect a female whale shark. Unfortunately, there, when you find a dead whale shark, it's usually at an aggregation site and they're very rarely a reproductive age female. I've not found one yet. But if someone could get me an adult female whale shark, there are modifications to the reproductive structures that occur in females who store sperm. So if somebody can get me that shark, I can answer this question. But so far, nobody's done that. Okay, um, just a couple more things I wanna say. One is that this was a massive undertaking, especially the genetic data, 800 whale sharks across the global population. Many, many, many people contributed to this. Researchers in lots of different countries contributing samples uh, and other types of reagents. So this is very much a global effort. And I just wanna do a little bit of advertising. So I, I think I mentioned that I, I run, do research in Mexico in the summer primarily and Djibouti in the winter. And in both of those places, we take members of the public along as research assistants. So this is a sort of a paid expedition. The people come along, their trip fees allow us to do the research. They help pay for supplies, they help us charter the ship, um, make possible things that we really couldn't do on our own. And in return, people get to swim with whale sharks and they get to help out and participate in the research, taking photo IDs, looking at plankton, doing all kinds of other things. Um, last year, of course, none of this happened. This summer, I, Mexico is going to be very small scale if it happens at all. But in December, I hope to be back. And we will be running our Djibouti whale shark trip. It's a fantastic trip and feel free to contact me if you're interested in it. We spend usually three weeks. Participants come for a week at a time. We stay on this really cool ship. This is very remote. Water is beautiful. There's great snorkeling. There's great diving. And there's whale sharks. And these little whale sharks are just so pretty. I, I don't know. They're just bright and sparkly. And their spots are all bright. It's so much fun to swim with these little guys. This is a, a two years ago. I think this is two years ago's trip participants. We have a fantastic crew. We take 12 people each time. Very international group, usually the people coming from all over the world. And one of the coolest things that we do in Djibouti that you can't do anywhere else on those trips is at night, we hang a really bright light on the back of the ship and it collects plankton. And because of the features, because the water is very shallow, because the sharks stay in a fairly small area, they see the light wow. and they come in and they'll feed at night right off of our ship. So these guys, we actually had seven whale sharks two years ago when I took this video. Pushing each other out of the way, feeding off the back of the ship. It was, it was crazy. They were beating on the little guy, pushing him down so they could eat. It was hilarious. I actually shot this video hanging out the back window of my cabin. This is a great expedition. This is a little too remote, a little too much for you. Next summer, I plan to be back running uh, five-day Mexico trips, which is closer and wow. a little more accessible for most people. Um, you can, any of you can get my email, and you're welcome to contact me whether you want to Okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, um, All right, thank you. So I want to open the floor for a few questions. If people have questions, um, I think you should be able to just unmute yourself and you can ask. And if you are afraid to ask questions, you can also type them in the chat and I will get those and I can pass them along. So I'll give people a second. And people are also ask. welcome to send me an email and I'm happy to answer questions by email if they like. I have a question about the SAT tags. Mm -hmm. um, I apologize, my internet was cutting out, so if I missed something, um, I apologize. But I'm curious if there's been any, so there are 
extremely expensive and they only last for a certain amount of time. I'm curious if there's been any work to develop a sat tag that can actually generate its own power through the movement of the shark and then utilize that power to actually power something more energy um, with more energy requirements than a satellite tracker like actually a camera tracker that can then upload every so often um, to have more all uh, to, to have more information about what's actually happening not just where they're going there, there's a few parts to your question it's a great question there's a few parts to it there has been some talk at least certainly nothing i don't even know if prototypes of of self-powering tags um i know the idea's been out there and, but i'm not sure if there's research going on or where that stage of that is now as far as other types of information um photos from a long-term satellite tag like this so the the, the transmission is very expensive. So the amount of data that would be contained in photos would probably be prohibitive price-wise. We pay a lot for the, the transmissions. Um, I mean, everybody uses those satellites, right? It's just the regular Argo satellite. So there's lots of competition for uplinks and, and, it's, and it's pricey. So I think for this particular you know, type something of- something like Starlink? Well, so there are, so there are other things. There are things like Nat Geo's Critter Plan, for example. Um, this is a short-term tag that you put on the fin of the shark, and you it records all the shark's movements. I've seen some of these videos. They're great. You get not only things like position and water temperature, but you get pitch and yaw, and you get speed, and, and really cool stuff. I mean, these come with gyroscopes and all kinds of things. I've seen, seen great um modeling of exactly how the shark is swimming and how he's moving and how he's twisting the problem with those is again you can't technologically at this time you cannot upload that data you have to go get the thing back and depending on where you are that's possible um, very often what people will do those critter camps are not cheap so what they'll do is they'll put it on the shark and then they'll follow up and they'll follow them for like 48 hours or whatever and make sure they know where he is to get the tag back. But the, the data is incredible. Um, but it's a different if it's a different question than what you're asking. I, I don't know if it will be possible. Certainly it's not possible at this time to generate a long-term photography, a long-term camera type tag that uploads to satellites. You should go make one. The next question I have from the chat is, um, there's some interest around how you ended up studying whale sharks. Oh gosh, I've had kind of a random career, um, really. And I, I, I kind of think that's a good thing for students to know is that, you know, your plan can go sideways and it's not always bad. I, um, I mean, when Troy worked, I did human mouse genetics, working on diseases and genomic imprinting and methylation for a long time. Um, and when Tori came through my lab, that's the sort of thing we we're doing. But I, even then, I started working on whale sharks in the background in 2000. And that happened because I had friends I knew from diving who knew people at the Shark Research Institute. And shark genetics was just getting started. And they said, hey, you know anybody who does genetics? And my friend said, well, yeah, she does mice, but you know, my sharks. And to some extent, that's true. I mean, microsatellites are microsatellites. The analysis is really the same, whether you're looking at people or mice or sharks. So I kind of just fell into it. Um, I kept working on the mice for a long time, 15 years, the whole time I was at U of I. But I was always working on the sharks in the background. And then the opportunity came to do this full time. And so I that's when I left the, the mouse and the human work behind. That was in um, 2016. All right. I want to thank our speaker, Dr. Schmidt, for spending time with us today on Earth Day and telling us lots and lots about, about what's known and what's available out there around whale sharks. Um, with that, I want to wish everybody a good night. And don't forget, you probably have classes you should study for. And um, all my biology students out there, barcoding. We're doing barcoding right now. So you could get a job working in Jennifer's lab later on <laughs> if you so wish. <laughs>
So maybe I just recruited a bunch of students for you, Jennifer. There I, don't, you I don't know. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. This was fun. I enjoyed it.